Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, we're going to carry on working on the grade 12, 2015 um, supplementary paper. Um, and then obviously, after we've finished paper two, um, we will move on to I actually want to do the supplementary paper for 2016. Um, the supplementary papers. OK, but let's carry on with where we were at. And where we were at, we're proving that QBSP is a parallelogram. We hadn't done that yet. We had calculated the size of ORB, ORB that was 36.87 degrees. We had calculated the length of PQ. We had we know that PQ is parallel to SB because they told us. And we have the equation for this line, but what we don't have is to prove that QB, QBSP is a parallelogram. Okay, and where I left off yesterday was that I said to you, well, we know that these two lines are parallel. And we know the length of this is 10. So if we can get the length of this line here and show it to be 10 as well, then we know have proven that QBSP is a parallelogram for the simple reason that you'd have both sides or one pair of opposite sides parallel and equal. So that's another reason why you guys really need to know your properties of your different quadrilaterals, including your parallelogram. So let's do that. Let's find the length of SB. So I'm going to call this point two and I'm going to call this point one and you can go look for your distance formula if you want on your formula sheet it is the square root of and then it depends it doesn't matter it's either x2 minus x1 or squared plus y2 minus y1 or squared or the other way around it really doesn't matter x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. Again, it also doesn't matter which point you call 2 and which point you call 1, as long as you don't swap the x's and y's. So in other words, this is going to be x2, which is 7.5, so it's 7 comma 5 minus, this is 3 over 2, which is 1 and a half, so it's 1 comma 5, all squared plus y2 is 8 minus 0 all squared. Okay, which equals the square root of 7.5 minus 1.5 is 6, and 6 squared is 36, plus 8 squared is 64, so we get the square root of 100, which equals 10, yay! So therefore, this is also 10 units long. Therefore, we can say QBSP is a parallelogram because you've got one pair of opposite sides parallel and equal right let's move on okay in the diagram below the circle centered at m24 passes through c minus 1 2 and cuts the y-axis at e okay so here is your circle it's centered on m24 passes through minus 1 2 and cuts at e right the diameter of is cmd Okay, is drawn and ACB is a tangent, so we immediately know that that's 90 degrees. So let's determine the equation of the circle in the form x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. Okay, well, it's pretty easy because the first part is easy anyway because we've got the center of it. So therefore, we know it's x minus 2 squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to r squared. Now from here, there are two ways that we can find r. We can either go find the distance formula from these two. Another way, which is pretty easy and kind of the same type of thing, because it really uses the same formula, is we could just substitute this value, minus 1, 2, into this and find out what r squared is. And I think we're going to do it that way. So we're going to sub in minus 1, 2. So we're going to go minus 1, minus 2 squared plus 2 minus 4 all squared will equal r squared, right? So minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3, minus 3 squared is 9, plus 2 minus 4 is minus 2, squared is 4 is equal to r squared therefore r squared is going to equal to 13 and please grade 12 so not going to square root that now because we don't need it to be square rooted we want it in this form so it has to be x 
minus 2 squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to 13. There you go. Guys, if you decided to use a distance formula to work this out and you'd got 13 and then just sent it, that's fine too. There's no reason for you to not do that. Um, I kind of just use a shortcut because if you look at this formula, I want to show you something. If you get the distance formula out, okay, what is the distance formula? The distance formula equals square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So do you agree the distance, that radius, would be given by x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared and then we square root it but we want r squared because that's how we just square both sides so essentially by substituting minus one two into this equation i effectively was using the distance formula okay and that's because the distance formula and the circle equation are both based on pythagoras okay so let us erase this and let's move on to the next part of the question now it says write down the coordinates for D. Now please note it says write down, write down. It didn't say calculate, it says write down. Okay, and what they're doing is expecting you to realize that this M is the midpoint between D and E. So if you think about it this way, do you agree we have to go across X value and then up? And then we have to go across the same amount and then up the same amount to get to D. So if we know how far we went across here, we could add that to the two and we get the X value. Okay, so let's do that. We've got minus one to two is how many? So this unit here is three, right? From minus one to two is three units long. Therefore two plus three is going to be five. Okay. And similarly, we're going up by two. We're going from two to four so we're going up by two so you have to go up another two so four plus two is six so there you go the coordinates of d are five six okay now sorry i just want to erase this bit here there we go now it's a bit neater okay so now let's see it says determine the equation of a b Okay, in the form of y equals mx plus c. Okay, so the cool thing about AB is AB is a tangent. And what do we know about tangents? We know that they're always perpendicular to the diameter or the radius. So do you agree I could get the gradient of this dude, the CD? Then I can find the gradient of AB and that'll give me m. And then I can substitute in this point minus one, two, and I will get C. Okay, so let's do that. The first thing we're going to do is get the gradient of CD, which remember is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. And again, grade 12s, I really want you to think about the fact that all of these formulae, I think there's only one formula and it's not even on this page, it's on paper, it's on the other one with regards effective interest and um, actual interest rates. They're all on the formula sheet, okay? So you just have to look for them. Right, so please make sure you're using your formula sheet. So, oh, and the quadratic. Okay, let's move on. So I'm going to call this point 2 and this point 1. You could have used D, but to be honest, grade 12s, if I had had to calculate D like I did, and then I was asked to work out the equation of AB and I need to work out this gradient, I'm not going to use D in case I made a mistake. Maybe I went uh, 4 plus 2 is 7 for some stupid reason. And then I use the wrong number here in this question to work out the gradient and I get it all wrong. Rather use what they gave us, okay, because we know that those numbers are right. So therefore it's going to be y2 is going to be 4 minus y1 which is 2 over x2 which is 2 minus x1 which is minus 1. So 4 minus 2 is 2 over 2 plus 1 is 3. So the gradient of MC is 2 over 3. 
Therefore, the gradient of AB is what? We flip it and we times it by minus. It's minus 3 over 2. We flip it and then we put a minus in front of it. Okay, why is that? Because if your lines are perpendicular, M1 multiplied by M2 has to equal to minus 1. So just to prove to you that I'm right, M1 would be 2 over 3. Multiplied by M2 is equal to negative 1. Therefore, M2 is going to be minus 1 divided by 2 over 3. Therefore, M2 is equal to minus 1 times by 3 over 2, which is negative 3 over 2. Ta-da! There we go. Okay, not too bad here. Right, now we now have that we've got the gradient. Now we need the point. We want to C cut, the Y cut, should I say, which is the C intercept. So we need to substitute this point into the equation. So we've got Y is equal to negative 3 over 2X plus C. So we're going to substitute this value in. So we're going to go, the Y value is 2 is equal to minus 3 over 2 times by negative 1 plus C. Minus times minus is a plus. So 2 is equal to 3 over 2 plus C. So C is going to be 2 minus 3 over 2. Therefore, C is equal to a half. And if we have a look at that, we can see it is a positive value and it's below 2. So therefore, we're happy. That looks like it could possibly be a half. So therefore, the equation is y is equal to negative 3 over 2, x plus a half. Okay, yay. Now, what do they want? They want the coordinates of E. And E is where this circle cuts the y-axis. Okay, so let's think about this while I'm erasing. What is the x value at that point? Okay, this is where it cuts the y-axis. So what is the x value at that point? The x value at that point is zero, right? So do you agree I can take this equation over here, I can let x equal zero, and then what I can do is I can solve for y, okay? So let's have a look and see if that works. Okay, it will work, but let's just try anyway. We've got x minus 2 squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to 13. But look, if I had to say what is that point, it's going to be 0 something, right? Because that is where it cuts the y-axis, which is 0, right? So I'm going to let x equals 0 in here, and then I'm going to solve for y. And you'll see that I should get two y values. I should get this y value and that y value. And then once I've got those two y values, I'm going to have to use my intelligence to work out which y value I'm talking about. Okay, so let's do that. So we've got 0 minus 2 all squared plus y minus 4 all squared is equal to 13. So that becomes minus 2 squared is 4 plus, now let's multiply this out, comes y squared minus 8y plus 16 minus 13 all equals 0. So it becomes y squared minus 8y. 4 plus 16 is 20 minus 13 is going to be plus 7 equals 0. So do you agree the factors are going to be y and y? It's a minus and a minus because they both have to be the same and they both have to be a negative. And then 7 and 1. How do I get that? Well, 7 times 1 is 7 and 7 plus 1 is 8. Therefore, we've got y is equal to 7 or y is equal to 1. Okay, so then it's pretty obvious that that point there is at y equals 1 and this point here is y equals 7. So therefore the coordinates of E are going to be 0, 7. And guys, you can't leave your answer at like this and go, oh, well, I've worked out the coordinates of E. You have to go back and write that the coordinates of E are 0, 7 because they're looking for you to show that you know the coordinates are a pair of points starting with x and then ending with y. <laughs> so for the x value is 0 and the y value is 7. Okay, now it says show that EM 
is parallel to AB. Okay, so I'm going to try and draw this. don't know if I can. We're going to try that EM, here we go, is parallel to AB. Okay, so what do we know about parallel lines? We know that parallel lines have to have the same gradient, right? And we've got the gradient of AB. It is minus 3 over 2. So if we find the gradient of EM, and we show that that is also equal to minus 3 over 2, do you agree that we'll have proven that EM is parallel to AB? So that's what we're going to do. So the, we've got this gradient, it's minus 3 over 2. We now need to find this gradient. So since I've called this point 2 before, I'm going to now call this point 1. It really doesn't matter. So M is equal to Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So the Y2 is going to be 4 minus 7 all over X2 is 2 minus 0. 4 minus 7 is minus 3 over 2, and ta-da, it equals the gradient of AB, and therefore they are parallel. Okay, great thoughts. I actually don't think that was such a terribly scary question. They could have asked a much nastier question, so that was quite nice. Okay, now it says determine whether or not the circles have any equations x plus 2, y minus 4 equals 25, and x minus 5, y plus 1 equals 9 will intersect, show all calculations. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw a very rough diagram, very rough, just to give you an idea what's going on. Do you agree the radius of this is 5, because of this is going to be r squared, so the square root of 25 is 5, and the radius of this is 3. Okay, so we have the circle at x is minus 2, y is... Uh, 4, okay, so it's about over here, and it has some radius, so that's this one, okay. I don't know exactly where they look, they just kind of look like that, okay. Then we've got another circle, which is at x equals 5, somewhere up here, and y equals minus 1, and it has a radius of 3, so it's 5 minus 1, and it has a radius of 3. Now, the possibilities are that these graphs either cross entirely, so they intersect like they've done, or my drawing could be wrong and they don't touch, okay? But do you agree that if I work out the distance from here to here, in other words, from this point here, which should be at minus 2, 4, and this point here, which is at 5, minus 1, and if that distance is bigger than the sum of the radii, if it's bigger than 5 plus 3, then they don't cross at all, okay? Because that would mean that the circle would end over here somewhere and this circle would end somewhere over there and there'd be a gap between them. So if the distance is greater than 8, okay, then we are cool and they do not touch. However, if the distance is smaller than 8, okay, the distance between these centers is smaller than 8, then they cross. And if it's equal to 8, then they touch. They just touch. Okay, so now it says determine whether or not this, okay, let's do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the distance between these two points. And grade 12, they love asking this question, so you need to get used to seeing it, and you need to practice what you need to do. Okay, so the distance formula equals the square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. Okay, so again, let's call this point, oh, it really doesn't matter, we're going to call this point 2 and this point 1, and I just want to check it's minus 2, 4, and 5 minus 1, right? So we've got x2 is minus 2 minus 5 all squared plus 4 minus minus 1 or squared, okay, which equals x minus 2 minus 5 is minus 7, so it's minus 7 or squared, plus 4 plus 1 is 5 or squared, so minus 7 squared is 49, plus 25 is equal to that, 
which is the square root of uh, 5 and 9 is 14, carry 1, 2 and 4 is 6, it's 74. So what we need to do is get out our calculators, because I don't know what that is, and find the square root of 74. And we press the SD button, it becomes 8.6. So that is equal to 8 comma 6, which is definitely bigger than the actual dist between the, the two radii. In other words, there's a gap, okay? In other words, there's a chance that this circle here's um, set radius actually, I mean circle is actually like this. And there's a little gap, okay? So this radius over here is 5, and this radius over here is 3, but the distance between them is 8.6. So therefore, they will not intersect. They will not intersect. Okay, great tools. They really like throwing this type of question in. They really, really do. So you guys need to practice this, okay? You need to make sure that you know how to do this question because it comes up very often. Right, let's do a next question. Okay, so we're on to trig. Um, again, if you're following this paper as I'm going through it, um, and you might notice that I've missed out some questions. The reason for that is that I've actually done quite a few of these questions from this exam paper while I was doing practice questions for you guys on different sections, when I was teaching the different sections. So if you come across a question on specific things like compound angles or whatever, and you see that I've missed it, then go look at a recording of that lesson. You'll find those questions in it. Okay, I'm not, it just seems silly to repeat the questions when you can watch a recording. Okay, it says, if x is 3 sine theta and y is 3 cos theta, determine the value of x squared plus y squared. Okay, that's not too bad. So we've got 3 sine theta, and don't worry, I'm going to rewrite it now plus 3 cos theta all squared. So what does that really mean? It means 3 squared is 9 sine squared theta plus 3 squared is 9 cos squared theta. So do you agree I can take out a 9? And what are we left with? We're left with sine squared theta plus cos squared theta. But sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals what? It equals 1. So therefore, the correct answer is just 9. Nice, easy question, actually. Right, now we're getting to the nitty-gritty, some nitty-gritty stuff. Okay, so <laughs> let us get going with this. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is draw a cast diagram. Okay, all stations to Cape Town. Okay, so the first thing we have is sine of 540 minus x. Okay, so 540 is obviously bigger than sine of, three, of 360. So what I want you to do is think about what it would be if it was, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce it a little bit. We're going to um, take it to 360 minus. So what I mean is, um, what I mean is, I'm going to say sine of 540 minus x is the same as saying sine of 540 minus 360. So that becomes a 0, that becomes a 7, and that's 270. So now this is the same as sine of 270 minus x multiplied by sine of negative x minus cos of 180 minus x multiplied by sine of 90 plus x. Okay, so I'm not going to do a line for every one of these. I'm actually going to now break them down. I just wanted to talk to you about that 540. So now, um, right, so now sine of 270 minus x. 270 minus x, okay, let's do this, naught, 90, 180, 270, and 360. So do you agree the sine of 270 minus x is actually a co-function of sine of, same as sine of 90 minus x, okay? So do you agree that we could say 
that this is the same as saying sine of 90 minus x because it's in this quadrant and it goes from the vertical. Now, what did we learn about co-functions yesterday? We learned that if you take, do you remember this? Do you remember the co-function rule? I just want to erase this erasing so that I can actually show you what it is. Okay. Okay, watch. Do you remember that we did this and we said that if we had that this was x and this was y and this was r and we had that this was theta and this was 90 this would be 90 minus theta so sine of 90 minus theta would be opposite over hypotenuse which is x over r okay opposite over hypotenuse but then when we talk about theta that is adjacent to hypotenuse so that is the same as cos of theta so it's the same thing happening here except that it's negative because there's another fourth third quadrant and sine is negative so it's going to become negative cos theta sine of negative x is basically saying we want to go down and we want to look at the sine of that so the sign of that is what? What is the sign of that? Um, so it's just going to be minus sine x minus cos of 180 minus x. Um, just can you hold for half a second? I seem to be having a problem with this actual um this actual computer just a second i want to see what's going on here um okay so cos of 180 minus x puts me in the second quadrant and cos is negative there so it becomes minus cos x and do you remember that yesterday we also taught you about sine of 90 plus x where we took it across over here and we went all the way around and we showed you the sine of 90 plus x was the same as cos x okay so if you don't remember that then go and look at the video from yesterday so what do we have now do you agree that we've got um minus cos why have I suddenly got a theta here? Just a second. That is an x. It's supposed to be an x. And I'm supposed to be writing in red. X. Okay. So, um, okay. So this becomes minus cos x minus sine x. This becomes minus cos x. 180 minus is minus cos x. And then we also have that cos x. So what do we got? We've got minus cos x sine x becomes cos x sine x. Then it becomes minus times minus is plus cos squared x. Okay. And then... Um, Yeah, I'm right. Sorry, I'm just, I was just worried about the sign of 270 minus x being wrong, but I am right. Um, I'll show you how this works. Another way that we can do it, let's just check it, shall we? Let's just check it. The other way of doing this dude here, a sign of 270 minus x, is to do this, is to rewrite it as a compound angle. So we'd have sign of 270 minus x is the same as sine 270 multiplied by cos x minus cos 270 and then sine x right so if you're not sure what sine 270 is you could look at your sine graph it does that and 270 is going to be minus one so it's minus cos x minus cos of 270 goes like this, da, 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 and cos of 270 is zero, so it's minus zero. So this is minus cos x, I'm not getting mad. So this becomes cos x sine x minus 
cos x cos x and again to prove the 90 plus x one to you just think i'm just showing this so you don't have to think about memorizing it i'm worried that sorry i'm just getting a bit distracted because i suddenly realized that i'm worried about the fact that you have to memorize these things and not understand them perfectly so a better way to do it is actually to just prove it to you so let's look at this if this is sine of 90 plus x do you agree that by using our compound angles we can say well this is sine of 90 um, cos x plus cos of 90 sine x. Do you agree? So now sine of 90 is 1 multiplied by cos x, okay, plus cos of 90 is 0. If you think about the cos graph again, it goes wee and that there is not, so it's 0. So therefore you've just got that this is cos x. Okay, so that's where you can get it from. Sorry, I was a bit distracted because I was really worried about the fact that I was going, do you remember, do you remember? And it's not cool to have to remember things in the exams when you can work it out. Okay, so now you know how to get it if you don't remember. Okay, so now we've got cos x sine x plus cos squared x. Um, and what can we do with that? We could actually take out a common factor of cos x if we wanted to, and we're left with sin x plus cos x, and that's as far as we can go with that. Right, now let's look at another question. Okay, in this question, what is going on? Why are you, why are you doing this? Oh, the connection to the SCAP meeting was lost. Right, I'm sorry about that. I don't. I didn't even see that you were lost. Um, so let me start with this question, yes, yeah, so that we can see exactly where we're at. Um, yeah, and I'll go back and watch the recording and see what we missed out. Okay, so it says in the diagram below, t is point xp. It's in the third quadrant, and it's given that sine alpha is p over the square root of one plus p squared. Okay, sine of alpha. Hang on, let me just draw that better. Let me just draw that better. Erase. I'll go up instead of down. Okay, I won't. I'll just draw it better. So sine of alpha is equal to p over 1 plus p squared. Okay, so sine of alpha goes all the way around. Okay, and it's equal to, remember, the opposite over the hypotenuse. Okay, so we know that this is the y value, so we know that that's p. So that makes sense, therefore, that this is the same as saying that that's alpha. This is the hypotenuse, so that there is 1 plus p squared, the square root of 1 plus p squared. And so show that x equals minus 1. Well, we've got the hypotenuse, and we've got the opposite. So now we can get the the adjacent side or the horizontal. So we're going to use Pythagoras and we're going to go, well, we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. To work out x, we're going to go r squared minus y squared, square root it, and it should give us x, okay? So the r is this thing here. So let's first just square root and then I can always square root it there and okay, let's do that. So let's square root at the end. So r squared is going to be the square root of 1 plus p squared squared minus this which is p squared and that is going to give us our x squared which is the horizontal yeah okay so if we square root, that becomes 1 plus p squared minus p squared is going to be x squared these cancel, so therefore we have 1 is equal to x squared, and obviously then x is going to be either plus or minus 1. But if you look over here, do you see this on the negative x-axis, so therefore the x 
has to equal negative 1. So there we go. We've just proven that x is equal to negative 1. Pretty cool, hey? Right, so you're using really basic grade 9 maths using Pythagoras. Nice and easy. Okay, now, no, 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 let me just go back here. Yes, so this is a 1. Okay, now it says, write cos of 180 plus alpha in terms of P in its simplest form. So cos is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is 1 over the hypotenuse, which is square root of 1 plus P squared. And I can't think of putting it in any other simpler form. Um, yeah, so that's it. Now it says, show that cos 2 alpha can be written as 1 minus p squared over 1 plus p squared. Okay, so remember that cos 2 alpha can be written as either cos squared alpha minus sine squared alpha, or it can be written as 1 minus 2 sine squared alpha, or it can be written as 2 cos squared alpha um, minus 1. But since we've just had to work out cos of alpha and we've just had to, we're given that, I'm pretty sure that we can use this one. It actually doesn't matter which one you use, you should be able to get out the answer anyway. But let's use the first one. So the cos squared alpha is going to be what we just worked out, which is 1 over root p squared. So it's 1 over root 1 plus p squared. Okay all squared minus this thing squared p over the square root of 1 plus p squared all squared okay so do you agree that that means it's going to be 1 over 1 plus p squared minus p over 1 plus p squared oh it's quite good so far squared the common denominator is obviously 1 plus p squared, and what you're left with is just 1 minus p squared. Ta-da! So there you go. You've got your beautiful cos 2 alpha. Right. Okay. It says, for which values of x will 2 tan x minus sine 2 x over 2 sine squared x be undefined if the interval is between 0 and 180? For this to be undefined, this dude here has to be equal to 0. So therefore, we're going to say, okay, let's have a look at that. When is 2 sine squared x equals 0? Well, obviously, then we can divide by 2 and we can ignore it. So we've got sine squared x is equal to 0. So we now want to find out when sine x is equal to 0. So do you agree that if we draw the sine graph, and we go la, 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 do you agree it's 0 at naught? and at 180 degrees. And they, we would normally do a general solution, but they've actually told us the interval. So it's for which values of x will this be undefined? It'll be undefined when x is equal to naught or x equals 180 degrees. There you go, nice and easy, right? Now it says prove, prove this identity that 2 tan x minus sine 2 x over 2 sine squared x equals tan x. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're obviously going to start at the left-hand side. And we're going to go 2, and I'm going to make this easy immediately. I'm going to go sine x over cos x minus sine 2 x luckily only breaks in, up into one thing. So I'm going to write here it's 2 sine x cos x all over 2 sine squared x. Okay, so do you agree I can take out a common factor at the top of 2 sine x there and 2 sine x there? So I'm taking out 2 sine x and I'm left with 1 over cos x minus cos x all over 2 sine squared x. Okay, so do you agree that the 2 cancels with the 2 and the sine x cancels with the square? Now I'm left with 1 over cos x minus cos x all divided by sine x. Okay, 
So we can find a common denominator here of cos x. Do you agree? And what are we left with? We're left with cos, cos x. Sorry, let's try again. We're left with 1, 1 minus cos squared x because there's a common denominator here. Well, there's a denominator if you have 1. So 1 goes into the cos x, cos x times, so we multiply it. And this is times by 1 over sine x. 1 minus cos squared x is sine squared x over cos x times by 1 over sine x. Cancel, cancel, equals tan x. Yay, we're all genii and we just got our marks. Right, grade 12, that's as far as we're going to go today. Um, so please, please, please make sure that you understand this and join me tomorrow and we will continue going through this paper too. Have a great day.